Thank you. Is the, is the microphone working? Is that fine? Okay, uh, again, my name is Davin Cardenas. Uh, I'm the co-director of the North Bay Organizing Project in Sonoma County. We are a county-wide organization. We, um, we organize institutions. We organize people where they're already organized, wh whether that's within a church, a union, an environmental organization, a student organization. We have a presence here on Sonoma State campus as well. And, uh, and we all come together because the simple equation that we always talk about is uh, in, if you don't have any money, like myself, I have some, I mean, but uh, more people equals more power in the democratic process. Uh, if you have a lot of money, then you have a lot more power very quickly and you have more access to power. Um, but that's also kind of a stain on our democracy where only the wealthiest make a lot of the decisions, a lot of the policies, they drive policy locally, nationally, and globally. And, uh, and where does that leave uh, communities that don't have all those resources already organized? Um, my title is a community organizer. Um, which is something I love. It's my profession. It's my trade. It's what I have to offer to the world. Uh, if I wasn't doing community organizing, I don't know if I have that many more skills beyond this. So I might be out of a job. I'm not sure. But uh, the idea of community organizing is as old as the Bible. Um, and it has also been renewed. The, the, the vigor around what a community organizer is also came up a lot um, eight years ago with the election of President Barack Obama, who was also a community organizer on the south side of Chicago before he went into politics. So his, uh, he was also trained in similar methodologies as myself. Um, I talk about uh, essentially my formation as a, uh, as a community organizer comes from two separate methodologies. Uh, one coming out of the popular movements and revolutionary movements of Latin America that really sprung up in the 50s, uh, took more predominance in the 60s and 70s, where uh, organizers were, were using something called popular education. And if any of you have been able to read or access like Paolo Freire, um, this is the roots of a lot of the community organizing where you know, traditional uh, political thought, educational thought would say that I am the one who possesses knowledge and I am going to uh, give my knowledge into your minds who are empty vessels who need to be trained in what I know because my knowledge is the, the greatest and you all need to learn this and I'm going to implement my ideas into you so you're better formed as a person. That's fine, and a, a lot of our traditional educational systems include that type of, of, of thinking or thought process. Popular education is saying that we all bring something to the table. Every teacher is a student, and every student's a teacher. We all are processes of our for, uh, formed from our environments. We all bring knowledge and lived experience to the table, so we all have something to share in the process. And when it came to a lot of the revolutionary movements, when you were working with farm workers, when you were working with people who were thrown off their lands, uh, there was a lot of indigenous knowledge. Uh, the, you know, often the best strategies for resilience and how we actually create new and thriving communities exist in communities that are being most impacted by war, by global climate change, by uh, uh, you know, reduced wages, sexism, all these things. Uh, it actually exists. So popular education goes back and says, well, let's learn. Let's learn what we already know, our traditional ways, how we plant crops. Right? How we uh, teach our families how to cook, how we use traditional uh, herbs and medicines to actually uh, live and thrive, how we learn. And so uh, part of my formation was in popular education, and I implemented it with uh, day laborers out in, West, in, the, in the town of Grayton in West Sonoma County. Uh, and and uh, part of that was very tied to this idea of, of liberation theology, which came out of the uh, Latin American movements as well in El Salvador, in Nicaragua, and other uh, countries in the 60s, 70s, where churches and even priests were joining the struggle for, uh, for political revolution and for personal liberation and saying that uh, it's, uh, we want to save our souls in heaven, per se, but we also actually need to liberate our bodies here on earth. It isn't good to just live as, uh, in, in an impoverished state or a slave state while we're here on this very finite time on earth so that we're waiting for the, for the afterlife, but rather, are we actually going to liberate our bodies here on this earth and, get, uh, uh, and not wait for that piece of the pie in heaven? You know, you know, saving our souls and all that is very good and it's very important if you believe in that. But there's also work that needs to be done here on earth. And that's why we're, we're living here, right? And we, you know, we might consider God to be a God of history, somebody who's 
some, some being that's intervening on earth to actually begin creating social movements. Um, so that's one aspect of, of myself as a community organizer. The other uh, side of it comes very much from um, out of the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s in, in, in places like Chicago and large urban areas where there was like solid economic devastation taking place in communities. Um, and th there are these neighborhood associations, these churches, uh, these schools were actually beginning to develop this idea of power, of actually taking power back because the conditions were so terrible that they actually had to begin linking themselves as tenant associations, as neighborhood groups, as churches, as schools, um, and, and fighting for better living conditions. And a lot of that comes from Chicago, from Saul Alinsky. Um, and I, ho I hope also if I'm throwing out names, it, uh, if you want you know, me to refer to them again or you have questions, these are all like really great reads too, uh, just in terms of like our own political development. Um, and so, uh, you know, from, from Saul Alinsky and from some, uh, you know, Saul Alinsky ended up really influencing Fred Ross, who trained Cesar Chavez. Chavez far, uh, organizes the farm workers in California, creates a farm worker movement. But there was a methodology, there was a practice put in place of people thinking around concepts of how you're going to organize people for liberation, right? How you're going to organize people so that they're assuming their bodies are now the key players in developing a new society, or at least developing their new neighborhood, or developing their new union, or their new school. It wasn't, you know, part of organizing for me is stopping this transfer of responsibility that like, okay, well, you know, I vote, you know, there's primaries coming up here. I vote in November, the president's going to do that, or the governor's going to do that, or the mayor's going to do that, or even in our churches, uh, you know, the priests and the pastor are going to take care of this, right? Or even us, you know, we're always transferring our responsibility onto other people and community organizing and saying, no, we actually have to assume responsibility to actually create the changes around us. And the only way we can do that is by having power. It's by having power, it's by having power. And so uh, myself, I'm, I'm in this uh, business, right, in this social movement to accumulate as much power for myself as humanly possible. And that sounds harsh, right, because we're used to power really having negative connotations a lot of the times, um, but w power is defined by the dictionary is the ability to act. The ability to act, nothing less, nothing more. So then it becomes a question of who has it, right? Who has it? And often, right now, in, in, uh, in the dominant paradigm, right, it's held by very, very few people, very few elements, and it's really the wealthiest who are able to wage it on working people, on middle class people, on other countries. And so uh, we're saying that, no, we actually have to have it for ourselves. So me, as an individual, I like the idea of organizing with people because I don't have money, but I have more people. The more people I organize, the more personal power I have. Personal power is part of it, and it's, for me it's important because me without power, I'm actually a very timid person. I'm actually very quiet. I'm actually too stuck in my head too much. I'm thinking about stuff, and I'm not able to actually get out of that, and, uh, and I, I'm actually small and weak. And uh, for me, that's the worst thing I could ever feel, is uh, to be insignificant, to be pushed to the side, and to, to know that I have very strong values and a, a, social, a, a system of love, compassion, and care inside of my heart that gets stuck inside my heart, and I have no power to actually influence the world around me. So for me, it's personally important to actually have more power, the ability to act off of my value system. But uh, we're also creating a movement, right? It's also where I find other people who have been devastated by the economy, who have been devastated by sexism, by rape, by uh, uh, social inequalities, by war. You know, people who have literally had to leave their homeland because of war or because of climate change. You know, these are the people we're actually building a movement with. And when we talk about building a movement, we're also trying to challenge some do dominant paradigms that are prevailing in our society. Uh, uh, you know, the, the idea of, of, of patriarchy, right, of, of a male-dominated society where men are making the rules and have done that historically for thousands of years now. We feel the effects right now, right, uh, not only in mass media and mass culture, but actually how we talk about uh, gender issues, how we talk about uh, gay LGBT community, how women talk about themselves, right, and, uh, and how laws are actually made and imposed on people 
based on, on a very male-dominated vision of the world. And then, you know, even talking about our labor, right, and the extraction not only of resources, right, so resources being extracted every day. We see a, a, a forest, we're going to cut that down. We see a river, we're going to exploit it to its greatest potential. But also our labor is being exploited at the same time, right? Our, our labor, our physical labor, you know, uh, most people working in service sector jobs here in Sonoma County, most people uh, making minimum wages, right? Minimum wages being the legal minimum somebody can pay you for your labor. You know, if they could pay you less, they would, but there's laws against that, right? And so, so our labor is being extracted at the same time. Um, and if you're going to extract someone's labor, if you're going to take people's land, whether that's in Mexico, whether that's anywhere, you're going to need a military force to implement that. There's absolutely no way that you could take somebody's labor, take people's land, take resources from the earth, and think there's not going to be a pushback. And if there's a pushback, you're going to need a military force to actually impose that will, right? The state's will of taking, privatizing properties, extracting people's labor. You're going to need a police force or a military force to actually implement that. So our economy, as it stands right now, is based on certain worldviews right, worldviews, but it's also uh, about extraction of labor, extraction of resources, and it's all also about the imposition of military might in, that, in order to actually move these things forward. And we're trying to build something different, right? We're trying to build something different. So uh, I, I know you've all been talking about the globalized economy and things of that nature. You know, part of my political inspiration um, growing up, I actually am from Southern California, and, uh, and I think I... Uh, Fortunately, I started reading books at a young age, but there was a couple key movements that really impacted me. One, in the mid-90s, we had uh, Prop 187. You had a very racist governor in California named uh, Pete Wilson, and, uh, and he was actually really implementing harshly anti-immigrant laws in California in the mid-90s. And uh, if you know California now, actually we've kind of come semi-circle or, you know, close to a full circle around what policies uh, are for immigrants, for workers, but, you know, maybe one day we're going to dig up the bones of Pete Wilson and just examine it as, like, a, what kind of a species was this, in California at least, but there was heavily racist laws being implemented uh, against immigrant people um, by a racist governor. And so that was politicizing. Pro there was something called Prop 187. You know, if you listen to Tupac, there's some Tupac lyrics where he's talking about Prop 187 and Pete Wilson and this and that, but... Um, this was politicizing because it was the first time that high school students started walking out, marching, and there was like a, a political movement. A lot of the people that I work with right now are descendants of Prop 187. Their first political action was leaving their high school classroom to protest in the streets. And then, of course, you had the L.A. riots in the mid-90s. Um, some of you might know and might not know. And then there was something that happened in Mexico that took place in 1994. January 1st, 1994, there was uh, something that the United States, Mexico, and Canada, they passed something called NAFTA, uh, which is a, a free trade agreement. And anybody heard of NAFTA a little bit? Hopefully there's some reading on that. Um, so there was a free trade agreement passed, and essentially what free trade does is it knocks down borders for products. So... Uh, Basically, Mexico, corn growers, and our, you know, corn in Mexico is life, right? It, it runs in our blood. It's, it's, it's a part of our culture, the basis of corn and civilization. <clears throat> Look at southern Mexico. Farmers have been growing corn for years, for years, for years, for centuries. And uh, in 1994, um, and essentially they could sell corn on a local market, right? NAFTA comes around this free trade agreement, it knocks down the border between the U.S. and Mexico. Before the U.S., if they were going to put our, like, GMO, transgenic corn stuffed with steroids and, you know, all this crazy corn that we do in surplus in the U.S., if we wanted to get that into the Mexican market, you'd have to pay a fee at the border, right? You'd have to pay a big fee, and then you can get your product into Mexico. Free trade says this is free now. The border drops all this surplus corn that we've been subsidizing our farmers in the U.S., it's all filled with chemicals and GMO. All that corn is now going to flood the Mexican market, right? The border just fell for products, not for people, but for products, right? So now the, Mexican, now the U.S. corn is flooding the Mexican market. So what happens to corn growers in Mexico? The basis of our civilization, right? They can't compete. They can't compete not only because this is genetically modified corn, but it's such a surplus that now it's cheaper than the corn that farm workers have been growing in Mexico for centuries, right? So what, what's a farm worker going to do? There's a couple options, right? You're either going to 
go to the cities and, uh, you know, migrate to the local cities, Mexico City, or the, the, uh, the sweatshop uh, labor in the north of Mexico, where we, we put factories, Ford, all, you know, half the clothes we're all wearing right now is made on these northern factories. You're going to go there for work. You're going to abandon your land. You're going to migrate to the U.S., you know, you're going to migrate. So 1994, you know, it wasn't like an ancient prophecy of like the, the children of the corn are going to return to, to their land in 1994. But from 1994 on, you see spikes in immigration. Right? This wasn't just like, oh, people are coming to visit Disneyland, right? Or, or thinking that the American dream is all that. This is people literally being forced off of their land by trade agreements they had nothing to do with. Right? By trade agreements they had nothing to do with. Now they're being forced off their land and coming to migrate or something that inspired me in 1994 was on January 1st, there was actually a rebellion of indigenous people, of native people in southern Mexico, in the state of Chiapas, and they were called the Zapatistas, right? Zapata was an old revolutionary leader. They took up his land, they took up arms, they covered their faces, and they said, we've been exploited for 500 years, right? Since, for, since the Europeans arrived at this continent, they've taken our land, our culture, everything we have, everything we know. And this trade agreement is the final straw, so we're taking our land back. And they actually, um, it was the outset of the internet in 1994. So they were actually able to broadcast their movement to the world. So it was the first digital rebellion that had ever taken place probably in, in, in our history. And so the messaging was so beautiful, so poetic, so fruitful. And it wasn't like the old left, like Marxist, like this is a proletariat, you know, Marxist movement. This was something new. This was completely indigenous. Like we were talking about popular education, this was native people using their historical knowledge to actually create a movement that included guns. Right? But actually included the, the way that they, they de democratically organize themselves for education. So they run their own schools now. They run their own health clinics. They run uh, all their food production, right? And they were able to do this based on going back to their traditional knowledge. And if you mess with them, there's going to be a, a war. And then a lot of international people would go down there and say, hey, I'm putting my life on the line too for these folks. If, you, if the helicopters are going to come, all the helicopters, all the bullets, all the bombs are made in the United States, if they're going to come, they're going to wipe us all out, right? And that, you know, nobody wants that. So for me in 1994, 95, 96, I was also heavily inspired by the fact that people who are supposed to have nothing, supposedly know nothing, were actually taking arms and taking their destinies back into their own hands, and it's still a successful movement in the south of Mexico. You can't enter those, uh, you, can, you can actually visit the territories. These shoes were actually made there, right? But, you, but this is still an ongoing movement that's happening in southern Mexico. So I think I drew a lot of my inspirations from there as well. Um, but I, I, I want to place that in the framework of how communities are beginning to resist uh, globalized economy, globalized capitalism, um, because there's always going to be a pushback. There's always going to be a pushback, but there's always going to be communities that are saying no as well. Um, any questions up to this point? Thoughts, reactions, uh, some that comes to mind? I don't want to just lecture so much. Anybody? Anybody heard of the Zapatistas before? Okay, read up. This, this is like, this is fruitful stuff. Last time, we, last, this day, last year, uh, there, was, there was a parents of, of 43 Mexican students uh, who, were, who were students that were becoming teachers in, their far, in, the, in these farmlands, and they had been disappeared by the government. And their parents were actually here on campus speaking last year um, because these were like revolutionary teachers. These were teachers that were getting taught on how to go back and actually teach local farm communities in, in southern Mexico. And because they were educated, because they were going to serve the poor, uh, and they were, you know, political, they were disappeared by the government, and they have not been found yet. Their, their remains haven't been found, but their parents were actually here a year ago. So, you know, I hope, you know, if, if, if nothing else, um, that, that as much as globalized economy is, is actually influencing the way we talk, the way we trade, the way we spend money and think about ourselves, there's always going to be resistance. There's always going to be pockets of resistance, no matter where you go. My job here in Sonoma County is to organize a local resistance, right, so that we're pushing back. Right now in Sonoma County, over the last decade, 1% of the Sonoma County, any, who here is from Sonoma County? Thank you. Wow. Okay. 1% One, 1 of Sonoma County, their, their wealth has increased by 40%. So that means 99% of us, our incomes have actually gone down by 10% here in Sonoma County, right? 
There's no way you can do that, again, without creating political forces, police forces that are going to maintain that type of order. So we're trying to organize. Um, the North Bay Organizing Project, again, we're composed of 20 institutions, uh, unions, churches, environmental orgs, student orgs, and we're trying to build power. Right now, we are working on the issues of housing, uh, public transportation, and public education. We're pushing for ethnic studies to be implemented in the high schools. We're pushing for restorative uh, justice, restorative discipline pra practices to be implemented in the high school because they're expelling and suspending, especially young brown men, at alarming rates. So we've, we've actually won some, some wins. We've got them to implement policies that minimize suspension and expulsions. We want to win ethnic studies so that people are actually, everyone, all students, are beginning to engage in history as a multi-faceted uh, subject that's not just dominated by a European narrative, but actually includes the histories and cultures of a whole array of people, because that's actually how we become better thinkers, bolder thinkers. We're actually learning about other people's culture and histories, right? In transportation, uh, if anybody rides a public bus system, in, if, you, if you ride Sonoma County Transit, right now as a student, you ride for free. You ride for free. And that's based on a campaign that we took up a year ago saying that public transportation should be public for everybody and it should be free. We think that college students and high school students and kindergartners should ride the buses for free. And that's what we're pushing for because this is a public good. We all pay taxes. We all pay into this system. And our public transportation sucks. So everybody's in cars. Everybody's isolated. CO2 emissions are up. Traffic's going crazy. It took me forever to even get here today. Right? But we're trying to create a, a public uh, transportation infrastructure and a, and, a, and a culture of ridership. So we're used to riding the buses. The bus system should be blossoming and flourishing and popping and not just, you know, a uh, code word for, for working people or poor people, right? And so, so right now, is, if you didn't know, you actually ride the bus for free as college students. But that took a people's campaign. That took a campaign of people who were affected by the issue, people who allied with those, those bus riders. And we had to push hard on the county to actually make that policy happen. We had to organize. We had to organize based on our common self-interest. And then with housing, you know, uh, Sonoma County is living the, the crisis uh, plain as day right now, the tech crisis, you know, the, the, the tech investment, the, the, the dominance of wealth and money in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, has driven up housing prices and pushed poor people, working people, students, middle class people to the margins of, of, of the area right now. Um, anybody being affected lately by the, the rent crisis in Sonoma County right now, Santa Rosa, Roner Park? Anybody feeling the squeeze a little bit? Okay. Well, over the last four years, rent, rents have increased by 40%, right? 40% in four years, and there's a 1% vacancy rate. So like, there's nowhere to rent. So if somebody's raising your rent, you say, well, I'll go somewhere else. There's nowhere to rent right now, so they can squeeze you while you're being stuck, right? And who does that affect the most? That affects students a lot. That affects middle class families. It affects immigrant families. It affects people who are now having to choose between, okay, do I put my child in karate or soccer, or do I have to pay this rent, right? You have to make life decisions based on your, you know, 30% of people are spending more than 50% of their income on rent. You know, spending more than 50%. You're not saving. You're not building up generational wealth. A lot of us are here in this room right now because of generational wealth, because our parents might have owned property, and at some point we, we were in a process where we began to be able to start accumulating wealth. And we're, we're actually in a university system right now because there was generations before us, some of us, that we were able to accumulate wealth. That wasn't my case, but that's, that is the case. And families right now, that, that opportunity is being completely decimated by a system that, again, they had nothing to do with. Working people, poor people, did not create this crisis, but they suffer the consequences. Right? They suffer the consequences of other people's decisions. So... Um, my job right now is to organize as many tenants, as many homeowners together to start pushing for policies that protect uh, tenants. In one week, May 3rd, we're going to have a vote at the Santa Rosa City Council to implement something called rent control and just cause eviction policies. And these policies will start protecting renters. It, it, it allow uh, landlords to only raise the rent so much per year. And, and you can't just evict somebody because... Right now, you can get evicted because you're a Warriors fan or you're a Rockets fan, you know? Right now, you can get evicted for any, because you're pregnant, right? Right now, you can get evicted for any reason. You don't have protections in Sonoma County. 
and, uh, and so we're pushing back. And so the basis of our campaign has really been that renters tell their stories, and we're using a whole array of tactics. We're trying to be as creative as possible because part of what we need to do, part of my job, I'm a community organizer, but I also consider myself a cultural worker. Right? We're trying to change the culture of how people see themselves. You never thought you can battle your landlord? Well, you're not going to battle the landlord. If you always thought that being poor was your fault, well, you're going to start acting out against your own in that, in that frame of mind, right? And, and so we're starting to organize tenants. We're using marches. We're doing art exhibits. Um, we've been doing theater. We've been doing whatever means we have to actually create a new narrative of how people make decisions and how people see themselves. We're trying to create a movement of people who love themselves, you know, which is, which is the hardest thing. We're so conditioned to actually hate pieces of ourselves, and we actually react and we hate on other people for the same reason. So to start creating a social movement where actually we, we have self-care, self-love, self-appreciation, even for our flaws, and we're starting to actually talk with our neighbors in the same way, like, oh, you're bright and beautiful too. That's, that, we're trying to shift the culture that doesn't exist right now in the United States. Right? And it's, it's on us. But you can't just talk about it. You can't just read about it in a book. You actually have to live it out. And we do that through political action. So that when people are fighting the city council, they're fighting their landlords, they're also starting to think about their own, like, oh, holy shit, like, I'm an important person. Like, I have power in my own life. And you do too. And you do too. We're a whole gang of people. So a year and a half ago, nobody would have said we could win rent control policies. Nobody. Not even like the traditional liberal class in Sonoma County. They said, don't even touch the issue. But we've pushed. We've organized. We've got working people talking, telling their stories, coming out to forums, pushing on the city council, building relationships with uh, city council members, right? Marching in the streets, telling stories in the news cycle all the time, talking with reporters. We've shifted the narrative because we're trying to organize for people power. If you don't shift the culture, right, we, we, we say culture precedes policy. Anytime anyone wants to create a policy, you have to shift the narrative of what's happening before you get to the policy or else you'll never win. And you're always going to be weak and underappreciated. And, and I'm not on this earth to lose, right? M my team's going to win in the end. It might take a while. But we're going to win. Our side is going to win. It's, it's inevitable. It's inevitable. There's too many of us. We're too bright and brilliant and wonderful to actually let society go where it's going now. So I was going to play a, a quick video. This is just like a food for thought, um, thinking about the creativity of what it takes to change and shift the conversation on a policy to actually win social change. Because again, we're not in the game of just theorizing, talking about issues having deep thoughts, we're here to create social change, change that affects the material conditions of people. So this, I thought the video was a good demonstration of that, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let it play. Sure. There once was a library, a beautiful, busy, award-winning library. Unfortunately, times were hard. The city of Troy, Michigan, no longer had enough money for its library, so it scheduled a vote asking the townspeople to approve a small tax increase. This angered an anti-tax group known as the Tea Party. Well-organized and well-funded, they started posting vote no signs, mailing flyers, and making noise. They dominated the conversation, changing the topic from library, books, and reading to taxes, taxes, taxes. With no money and an election less than a month away, the library needed help. They needed something attention-getting, audacious, maybe even vile. So we decided to form a group of our own and started planting signs around town that said, vote to close the library August 2nd, book burning party August 5th. The idea of book burning is bad enough, but gleefully making it a party, well, that angered people enough to send them to our Facebook page. You people are sick. This is disgusting. Reject the wackos. Vote yes. But we didn't stop there. We created videos. Imagine this times 200,000. How cool is that? Posted on Twitter. The Troy Library might be short on money, but it has books to burn. Created items for sale. A book bag. How ironic. 
We placed newspaper ads, created check-ins, posted flyers, and lined up entertainment. You guys are booking a band? People became enraged. Why would you burn books, idiots? This is horrible. Cheap imbeciles. What the f is this world coming we to? We should burn your signs instead. Complete and total this idiots. Is really this is just down. Jerks. They posted their own links, shared with friends, debated the merits of libraries and the audacity of burning books. The conversation spread from Facebook to city council meetings, from newspapers to TV. It grew from local to national, even international news. Once it reached a fevered pitch, we revealed the true intent of our campaign. A vote against the library is like a vote to burn books. And people started posting, tweeting, and reporting all over again. In the end, we had changed the conversation completely, from taxes, 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 to library, library, library. And on August 2nd, the yes voters, voters who don't normally turn out to vote, turned out at levels 342% greater than projected. And the library won by a landslide. The town's library, its beautiful, award-winning library, had been saved. Not every story at the library has a happy ending. Fortunately, this one did. So, so again, this is just a, it's, it's some, it's like political jujitsu, right? But it's taking the only resource that we have, which is our bodies, ourselves, and, and uh, putting it into the democratic process because we simply don't have the money to compete with um, a lot of the well-financed groups. Uh, when we talk about rent control, it's the same thing. There's groups of organized realtors, apartment managers, um, who have extensive political capital that they can actually buy politicians, that can actually invest in the campaigns for local upcoming elections, and we can't do that. All we can offer is, one, shift the narrative, tell the story, uh, and two, the power of the vote, right? The power of our, our side to actually enact votes, um, to organize tenants, and, uh, and actually engage them in the democratic process. Uh, and again, I think we're gonna win on May 3rd. I think we have four out of seven votes, I really hope so, um, but it's, it's been a constant uh, uh, campaign. It's been a year and a half of my life to actually organize this campaign. It doesn't end on May 3rd. If we win, then we actually have to get to the renters and start organizing them to vote in November because it can be completely wiped away in November. And, and the politics of it all doesn't rest, right? But we're trying to shape what politics and political engagement is. So it's not just the realm of rich men in suits who are making terrible decisions, but it's actually how we create music. It's actually how we create art. It's actually how, how we make rhythms and how we march and how we tell stories in the news and how we use different media outlets to actually engage a broader sector. And again, how we actually love ourselves, how we enact this idea of a value system um, or even an educational process that we're in. We're all, you know, you all are students right now. And, and taking it from the realm of our heads or our hearts, right, our mind and our, and our body, and enacting it in the world in a meaningful way. Because if we're just stuck in our heads, <clears throat> you know, again, like if you're, I always say that like values are a great thing. If you're a loving, kind person, that's good, that's okay. It doesn't do anything to affect the world if it's just inside of you. You know, uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said that love without power is mere sentimentality. It's mere sentimentality. It makes you a nice person. It's warm. But if you don't have power to live it out, then, then you're just a nice person, which is fine. I'm not going to judge anybody. But, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in a room, and I'm also the product of an educational system where I was given infinite privilege, right? This class right here has privileges that 97% of the world population would never imagine or have. And the question is, how do we actually use our privilege to actually start creating a better society? How do we take our values and our heart and our ability to care or have compassion and actually live it out in the world instead of it just being a nice thought? Or our educational process, the books we read, instead of just being stuck in our heads, how do we live that out in the world? So we're not just, you know, if this was a philosophical movement that I was engaged in, we'd be kings and queens by now because everybody has a deep opinion about something, but deep opinions don't create social change, right? We say that, that uh, power uh, doesn't give you knowledge necessarily. Power is a precursor to knowledge. 
But power, uh, 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 I'm sorry, knowledge, the, the, the refrain that knowledge is power, right? Knowledge being a precursor to having power. But knowledge alone does not give you power. It just makes you an interesting person or a deep person. And anybody could be, deep, be a deep person on Facebook or wherever it might be in any conversation you're having. But how do you take knowledge and organize for power around it where the people that share your value system are now on your side, they're on your squad. And you're actually live, working in the social realm based on that uh, common knowledge, common faith. You know, I work with a lot of churches. Uh, and to actually enact those deep thoughts, those deep ideas, or those warm feelings in your heart into the public realm. So I think, you know, part of, you know, what I'd just like to maybe leave it with, or if there's other questions that come up, please, um, but it's, it's just this idea of taking what we have in our hearts, this, this, this amazing educational opportunity we're given, and how do we throw the rope back? How do we start transforming society based on this immense privilege that we're given to actually be in a university system, to actually be, be on a campus every day of the week or however you might do it? And even if you don't come from privilege, even if you do, how are you going to use this opportunity to actually start uh, building something new based on, on this immense uh, uh, opportunity and potential that we have? Um, if you stay in Sonoma County, there's going to be a people's organization here for you to be a part of. You know, if you want to, we have an organizer here on campus as well that organizes college students. The college students of the junior college, they're going to march on the same day that we vote at city council. They're going to march from the junior college to the city council so that we have a huge contingent of students. We have a huge contingent of farm workers. We have a huge contingent of clergy and church members. And we have a huge contingent of union allies coming in. And you, you, can't, you can't mess with that. You know, city council members are not going to want to mess with that. And, uh, and the other side doesn't. They're, they have immense power because they have immense money. But it's a very homogeneous group of people who actually imposes laws that affect me, right, and affect my neighbors. And so we, we have to transform that dynamic and that paradigm. And the only way I know how to do that is by organizing people on common self-interest to actually live that out in the real world. And if... Uh, and if we could be successful, that means I'm going to have a whole new, that I'm going to be insignificant in 10 years. If I'm successful, that means the leaders that I'm developing are going to be 10 times more bold, inspirational, and effective than I even am, right? If I'm effective, that means that a democracy is actually going to have some balance and parity instead of just being dominated by rich folks. And that's not the world I want to live. That's not the world that's creating uh, healthy conditions for my family or anybody around me. That's not the, 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 the conditions that are creating uh, uh, parity in, in Latin America and Africa and Asia. That's not the, the system we, we can afford to live in. So we have to shift it. And um, you know, my analysis is much local as I'm paying attention to the, to the politics happening in Mexico or South Africa. We have to have an internationalist view of the world because people are struggling wherever we go. But if I go to South Africa right now, I, I can guarantee you I'm going to hook up with some people on the ground who are doing the same work, and we're going to have brotherhood and sisterhood right there, right? <clears throat> the, the beautiful part of my job, too, is I get to read about historical characters, and then I get to, like, drink whiskey with them, right? Or, like, drink coffee. With, like, I get to meet the people I'm studying, the people who have had significant impact, and I get to travel to places that, you know, I would have never thought of going, but it's part of a, a, a way of life, but it's also just a, a way that we're trying to impact and influence the, these few resources that we're given based on all that we have, which is our labor, which is our bodies, which is our ability to actually get together on common self-interest and impact social change. So I think I'm going to leave it like, well, I'll, I'll put out if, there, if uh, any of the professors have questions too, that something that I'm missing or you want me to cover, please. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think before I came to college, I had some ideas. I was reading some books, and I had vague political ideas, but I joined a, an organization on campus called MECHA, which is a Chicano student organization, 
And whether it's that organization or any organization, organizations are where we are able to put our thoughts and ideas into some type of social practice. So I, I really, uh, I think organizations, whatever they look like, it could be a PTA, it could be a church group, it could be a, a campus group, it's important because it's where you start living out your ideas or deep thoughts with other people. <clears throat> so you get out of the realm of your own head and your own thought process to actually engage with people around that same thought process. So for me, having an organization to plug into was transformative. And that's why I build organizations. You know, I, I help churches right now try to organize their churches better or local student groups or whatever it might be because that's the heart of how we actually live out our value system. So, yeah, having, having that, you know, not only the knowledge from books and classes, but the able, ability to link that in to other people who are wrestling with the same things as I was, you know, going through the same insecurities, the same processes, <coughs> was really critical. So, yes? How can we get the students involved in the <coughs> So, um, if there's a student... We can set up trainings on campus, like we can have a, 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 a organizing training here on campus for students. There's already a couple students in a, a couple other departments involved. Um, go to North Bay Organizing Project on Facebook. Like our page if you want to be updated. We have actions and trainings constantly. Um, and if there's issues that students are facing on campus, we're always open to organize around those or support faculty, like the, 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 the strike that almost took place a couple of weeks ago. Right? We want to make sure that our power can help faculty and vice versa. That's the only way we have to build and affect change is if we're actually uniting cross-sector like that. I think that's all the time we have. All right. Thank you.